Exhibit Piece by Philip K. Dick Read by Dwayne Bunny That's a strange suit you have on, the robot pub trans driver observed. It slid back its door and came to a rest at the curb. What are the little round things? Those are buttons, George Miller explained. They are partly functional, partly ornamental. This is an archaic suit of the 20th century. I wear it because of the nature of my employment. He paid the robot, grabbed up his briefcase, and hurried along the ramp to the history agency. The main building was already open for the day. Robed men and women wandered everywhere. Miller entered a private lift, squeezed between two immense controllers from the pre-Christian division, and in a moment was on his way to his own level, the middle 20th century. Gorning, he murmured, as controller Fleming met him at the atomic engine exhibit. Gorning, Fleming responded brusquely. Look here, Miller. Let's have this out once and for all. What if everybody dressed like you? The government sets up strict rules for dress. Can't you forget your damn anachronisms once in a while? What in God's name is that thing in your hand? It looks like a squashed Jurassic lizard. This is an alligator hide briefcase, Miller explained. I carry my study spools in it. The briefcase was an authority symbol of the managerial class of the latter 20th century. He unzipped the briefcase. Try to understand, Fleming. By accustoming myself to everyday objects of my research period, I transform my relation from mere intellectual curiosity to genuine empathy. You have frequently noticed I pronounce certain words oddly. The accent of that is an American businessman of the Eisenhower administration. Dig me? Hey, Fleming muttered. Dig me was a 20th century expression. Miller laid out his study spools on his desk. Was there anything you wanted? If not, I'll begin today's work. I've uncovered fascinating evidence to indicate that although 20th century Americans laid their own floor tiles, they did not weave their own clothing. I wish to alter my exhibits on this matter. There's no fanatic like an academician, Fleming grated. You're 200 years behind times, immersed in your relics and artefacts, your damn authentic replicas of discarded trivia. I love my work, Miller answered mildly. Nobody complains about your work, but there are other things than work. You're a political social unit here in this society. Take warning, Miller. The board has reports on your eccentricities. They approve devotion to work. His eyes narrowed significantly. But you go too far. My first loyalty is to my art, Miller said. Your what? What does that mean? A 20th century term. There was undisguised superiority on Miller's face. You're nothing but a minor bureaucrat in a vast machine. You're a function of an impersonal cultural totality. You have no standards of your own. In the 20th century, men had personal standards of workmanship, artistic craft, pride of accomplishment. These words mean nothing to you. You have no soul. Another concept from the golden days of the 20th century, when men were free and could speak their minds. Beware, Miller, Fleming blanched nervously and lowered his voice. You damn scholars. Come up out of your tapes and face reality. You'll get us all in trouble talking this way. Idolise the past if you want. But remember, it's gone and buried. Times change. Society progresses. He gestured impatiently at the exhibits that occupied the level. That's only an imperfect replica. You impugn my research? Miller was seething. This exhibit is absolutely accurate. I correct it to all new data. There isn't anything I don't know about the 20th century. Fleming shook his head. It's no use. He turned and stalked wearily off the level onto the descent ramp. Miller straightened his collar and bright hand painted necktie. He smoothed down his blue pinstripe coat, expertly lit a pipe full of two century old tobacco and returned to his spools. Why didn't Fleming leave him alone? Fleming, the officious representative of the great hierarchy that spread like a sticky grey web over the whole planet, into each industrial professional and residential unit, 
Ah, the freedom of the twentieth century. He slowed his tape scanner a moment, and a dreamy look slid over his features. The exciting age of virility and individuality, when men were men. It was just about then, just as he was settling deep in the beauty of his research, that he heard the inexplicable sounds. They came from under the centre of his exhibit, from within the intricate, carefully regulated interior. Somebody was in his exhibit. He could hear them back there, back in the depths. Somebody had got past the safety barrier set up to keep the public out. Miller snapped off his tape scanner and got slowly to his feet. He was shaking all over as he moved cautiously toward the exhibit. He killed the barrier and climbed the railing onto a concrete sidewalk. A few curious visitors blinked as the small, oddly dressed man crept among the authentic replicas of the 20th century that made up the exhibit and disappeared within. Breathing hard, Miller advanced up the sidewalk and onto a carefully tendered gravel path. Maybe it was one of the other theorists, a minion of the board, snooping around looking for something with which to discredit him. An inaccuracy here, a trifling error of no consequence there. Sweat came out on his forehead. Anger became terror. To his right was a flower bed. Paul scarlet roses and low-growing pansies. Then the moist green lawn, the gleaming white garage with its door half up, the sleek rear of a 1954 Buick, and then the house itself. He'd have to be careful. If it was somebody from the board, he'd be up against the official hierarchy. Maybe it was somebody big. Maybe even Edwin Carnap, president of the board, the highest ranking official in the New York branch of the World Directorate. Shakily, Miller climbed the three cement steps. Now, he was on the porch of the 20th century house that made up the centre of the exhibit. It was a nice little house. If he had lived back in those days, he would have wanted one of his own. Three bedrooms, a ranch-style California bungalow. He pushed open the front door and entered the living room. Fireplace at one end. Dark wine-coloured carpets. Modern couch and easy chair. Low, hardwood glass-top coffee table. Copper ashtrays. A cigarette lighter and a stack of magazines. Sleek, plastic and steel floor lamps. A bookcase. Television set. Picture window overlooking the front garden. He crossed the room to the hall. The house was amazingly complete. Below his feet, the floor furnace radiated a faint aura of warmth. He peered into the first bedroom. A woman's boudoir. Silk bed cover, white starch sheets, heavy drapes, a vanity table, bottles and jars, huge round mirror, clothes visible within the closet, a dressing gown thrown over the back of the chairs, slippers, nylon hose carefully placed at the foot of the bed. Miller moved down the hall and peered into the next room. Brightly painted wallpaper, clowns and elephants and tightrope walkers, the children's room. Two little beds for the two boys. Model airplanes. A dresser with a radio on it. A pair of combs. School books. Pennants. A no parking sign. Snapshots stuck in the mirror. A postage stamp album. Nobody there either. Miller peered in the bedroom bathroom. Even into the yellow tiled shower. He passed through the dining room. Glanced down the basement stairs where the washing machine and dryer were. Then he opened the back door and examined the backyard. A lawn and the incinerator. A couple of small trees and then the three-dimensional projected backdrop of other houses receding off into incredibly convincing blue hills. And still no one. The yard was empty, deserted. He closed the door and started back. From the kitchen came laughter. A woman's laugh. The clink of spoons and dishes and smells. It took him a moment to identify them, scholar that he was. Bacon and coffee, and hotcakes. Somebody was eating breakfast, a 20th century breakfast. He made his way down the hall past a man's bedroom, shoes and clothing strewn about, to the entrance of the kitchen. 
A handsome, late thirty-ish woman and two teenage boys were sitting around the little chrome and plastic breakfast table. They had finished eating. The two boys were fidgeting impatiently. Sunlight filtered through the window over the sink. The electric clock read half past eight. The radio was chirping merrily in the corner. A big pot of black coffee rested in the centre of the table, surrounded by empty plates and milk glasses and silverware. The woman had on a white blouse and checkered tweed skirt. Both boys wore faded blue jeans, sweatshirts and tennis shoes. As yet, they hadn't noticed him. Miller stood frozen at the doorway, while laughter and small talk bubbled around him. "'You'll have to ask your father,' the woman was saying with mock sternness. "'Wait until he comes back.' "'He already said we could,' one of the boys protested. "'Well, ask him again. "'He's always grouchy in the morning. "'Not today. He had a good night's sleep. "'His hay fever didn't bother him. "'The new anti-hiss the doctor gave him.' "'She glanced up at the clock. "'Go see what's keeping him, Don. "'He'll be late for work.' He was looking for the newspaper. One of the boys pushed back his chair and got up. It missed the porch again and fell in the flowers. He turned toward the door, and Miller found himself confronting him face to face. Briefly, the observation flashed through his mind that the boy looked familiar. Damn familiar. Like somebody he knew, only younger. He tensed himself for the impact as the boy abruptly halted. Gee, the boy said, you scared me. The woman glanced quickly up at Miller. "'What are you doing out there, George?' she demanded. "'Come on back in here and finish your coffee.' Miller came slowly into the kitchen. The woman was finishing her coffee. Both boys were on their feet and beginning to press around him. "'Didn't you tell me I could go camping over the weekend up at Russian River with the group from school?' Don demanded. "'You said I could borrow a sleeping bag from the gym because the one I had you gave to the Salvation Army.' "'because you're allergic to the k pock in it.' "'Yeah,' Miller muttered uncertainly. "'Don. That was the boy's name. "'And his brother, Ted. "'But how did he know that?' "'At the table, the woman had got up "'and was collecting the dirty dishes "'to carry over to the sink. "'They said you already promised them,' "'she said over her shoulder. "'The dishes clattered into the sink "'and she began sprinkling soap flakes over them. But you remember the time they wanted to drive the car and the way they said it? You think they'd got your okay, and they hadn't, of course. Miller sank weakly down at the table. Aimlessly, he fooled with his pipe. He set it down in the copper ashtray and examined the cuff of his coat. What was happening? His head spun. He got up abruptly and hurried to the window over the sink. Houses. Streets. The distant hills beyond the town, the sights and sounds of people, the three-dimensional projected backdrop was utterly convincing. Or was it the projected backdrop? How could he be sure? What was happening? George, what's the matter? Marjorie asked, as she tied a pink plastic apron around her waist and began running hot water in the sink. You better get the car out and get started to work. Weren't you saying last night old man Davidson was shouting about employees being late for work and standing around the water cooler talking and having a good time on company time? Davidson. The word stuck in Miller's mind. He knew it, of course. A clear picture leaped up. A tall, white-haired old man, thin and stern. Vest and pocket watch. And the whole office, United Electronic Supply the twelve-storey building in downtown San Francisco, the newspaper and cigar stand in the lobby, the honking cars, jammed parking lots, the elevator, packed with bright-eyed secretaries, tight sweaters and perfume. He wandered out of the kitchen, through the hall, past his own bedroom, his wife's, and into the living room. The front door was open and he stepped out onto the porch, the air was cool and sweet. It was a bright April morning. The lawns were still wet. Cars moved down Virginia Street, toward Shattuck Avenue. Early morning commuting traffic. Businessmen on their way to work. Across the street, Earl Kelly cheerfully waved his Oakland Tribune as he hurried down the sidewalk toward the bus stop. 
A long way off, Miller could see the Bay Bridge, Yerba Buena Island, and Treasure Island. Beyond that was San Francisco itself. In a few minutes, he'd be shooting across the bridge in his Buick, on his way to the office, along with thousands of other businessmen in blue pinstripe suits. Ted pushed past him and out onto the porch. Then it's okay? You don't care if we go camping? Miller licked his dry lips. Ted, listen to me. There's something strange. Like what? I don't know. Miller wandered nervously around the porch. This is Friday, isn't it? Sure. I thought it was. But how did he know it was Friday? How did he know anything? But of course it was Friday. A long, hard week. Old man Davidson breathing down his neck. Wednesday especially, when the General Electric order was slowed down because of a strike. Let me ask you something, Miller said to his son. This morning, I left the kitchen to get the newspaper. Ted nodded. Yeah, so? I got up and went out of the room. How long was I gone? Not long, was I? He searched for words, but his mind was a maze of disjointed thoughts. I was sitting at the breakfast table with you all, and then I got up and went to look for the paper, right? And then I came back in, right? His voice rose desperately. I got up and shaved and dressed this morning. I ate breakfast, hot cakes and coffee, bacon, right? Right, Ted agreed. So? Like I always do. We only have hot cakes on Friday. Miller nodded slowly. That's right. Hotcakes on Friday, because your Uncle Frank eats with us Saturday and Sunday, and he can't stand hotcakes, so we stopped having them on weekends. Frank is Marjorie's brother. He was in the Marines in the First World War. He was a corporal. Goodbye, Ted said, as Don came out to join him. We'll see you this evening. School books clutched, the boys sauntered off, toward the big modern high school in the centre of Berkeley. Miller re-entered the house and automatically began searching the closet for his briefcase. Where was it? Damn it, he needed it. The whole Throckmorton account was in it. Davidson would be yelling his head off if he left it anywhere. Like in the True Blue cafeteria that time they were all celebrating the Yankees winning the series. Where the hell was it? He straightened up slowly as memory came. Of course. He had left it by his work desk where he'd tossed it after taking out the research tapes, while Fleming was talking to him back at the history agency. He joined his wife in the kitchen. Look, he said huskily, Marjorie, I think maybe I won't go down to the office this morning. Marjorie spun in alarm. George, is anything wrong? I'm completely confused. Your hay fever again? No, my mind. What's the name of that psychiatrist the PTA recommended when Mrs. Bentley's kid had that fit? He searched his disorganised brain. Grunberg, I think. In the medical dental building. He moved toward the door. I'll drop by and see him. Something's wrong. Really wrong. And I don't know what it is. Adam Grunberg was a large, heavy-set man in his late forties, with curly brown hair and horn-rimmed glasses. After Miller had finished, Grunberg cleared his throat, brushed at the sleeve of his Brooks Brothers suit, and asked thoughtfully, Did anything happen while you're out looking for the newspaper? Any sort of accident? You might try going over that part in detail. You got up from the breakfast table, went out on the porch, and started looking around in the bushes. And then what? Miller rubbed his forehead vaguely. I don't know, it's all confused. I don't remember looking for any newspaper. I remember coming back in the house. Then it gets clear. But before that, it's all tied up with the history agency and my quarrel with Fleming. What was that again about your briefcase? Go over that? Fleming said it looked like a squashed Jurassic lizard. And I said, no, I mean about looking for it in the closet and not finding it. I looked in the closet and it wasn't there, of course. It's sitting beside my desk at the history agency, on the 20th century level, by my exhibits. A strange expression crossed Miller's face. Good God, Grunberg. 
You realise this may be nothing but an exhibit? You and everybody else? Maybe you're not real, just pieces of this exhibit. That wouldn't be very pleasant for us, would it? Grunberg said with a faint smile. People in dreams are always secure until the dreamer wakes up, Miller retorted. So you're dreaming me? Grunberg laughed tolerantly. I suppose I should thank you. I'm not here because I especially like you. I'm here because I can't stand Fleming and the whole history agency. Grunberg pondered. This Fleming. Are you aware of thinking about him before you went out looking for the newspaper? Miller got to his feet and paced around the luxurious office, between the leather-covered chairs and the huge mahogany desk. I want to face this thing. I'm in an exhibit, an artificial replica of the past. Fleming said something like this would happen to me. Sit down, Mr. Miller, Grunberg said in a gentle but commanding voice. When Miller had taken his chair again, Grunberg continued. I understand what you say. You have a general feeling that everything around you is unreal, a sort of stage. An exhibit? Yes, an exhibit in a museum. In the New York History Agency, level R, the 20th century level. And in addition to this general feeling of insubstantiality, there are specific projected memories of persons and places beyond this world. Another realm in which this one is contained. Perhaps I should say the reality within which this is only a sort of shadow world. This world doesn't look shadowy to me. Miller struck the leather arm of the chair savagely. This world is completely real. That's what's wrong. I came in to investigate the noises, and now I can't get back out. Good God, do I have to wander around this replica the rest of my life? You know, of course, that your feeling is common to most of mankind, especially during periods of great tension. Where, by the way, was the newspaper? Did you find it? As far as I'm concerned, is that a source of irritation with you? I see you react strongly to the mention of the newspaper. Miller shook his head wearily. Forget it. Yes, a trifle. The paper boy carelessly throws the newspaper in the bushes, not on the porch. It makes you angry. It happens again and again. Early in the day, just as you're starting to work. It seems to symbolise in a small way the whole petty frustrations and defeats of your job, your whole life. Personally, I don't give a damn about the newspaper. Miller examined his wristwatch. I'm going. It's almost noon. Old man Davidson will be yelling his head off if I'm not at the office by... He broke off. There it is again. There what is? All this. Miller gestured impatiently out of the window. This whole place, this damn world, this exhibition. I have a thought, Dr. Grunberg said slowly. I'll put it to you for what it's worth. Feel free to reject it if it doesn't fit. He raised his shrewd professional eyes. Ever see kids playing with rocket ships? Lord, Miller said wretchedly. I've seen commercial rocket freighters hauling cargo between Earth and Jupiter, landing at LaGuardia Spaceport. Grunberg smiled slightly. Follow me through on this. A question. Is it job tension? What do you mean? It would be nice, Grunberg said blandly, to live in the world of tomorrow, with robots and rocket ships to do all the work. You could just sit back and take it easy. No worries, no cares, no frustrations. My position in the history agency has plenty of cares and frustrations. Miller rose abruptly. Look, Grunberg, either this is an exhibit on our level of the history agency, or I'm a middle-class businessman with an escape fantasy. Right now, I can't decide which. One minute I think this is real, and the next minute... We can decide easily, Grunberg said. How? You were looking for the newspaper, down the path, onto the lawn. Where did it happen? Was it on the path? On the porch? Try to remember. I don't have to try. I was still on the sidewalk. I had just jumped over the rail past the safety screens. On the sidewalk. Then go back there. Find the exact place. Why? So you can prove to yourself there's nothing on the other side. 
Miller took a deep, slow breath. Suppose there is. There can't be. You said yourself, only one of the worlds can be real. This world is real. Grunberg thumped his massive mahogany desk. Ergo, you won't find anything on the other side. Yes, Miller said, after a moment's silence. A peculiar expression cut across his face and stayed there. You found the mistake. What mistake? Grunberg was puzzled. What? Miller moved toward the door of the office. I'm beginning to get it. I've been putting up a false question, trying to decide which world is real. He grinned humorlessly back at Dr. Grunberg. They're both real, of course. He grabbed a taxi and headed back to the house. No one was home. The boys were in school and Marjorie had gone downtown to shop. He waited indoors until he was sure nobody was watching along the street and then started down the path to the sidewalk. He found the spot without any trouble. There was a faint shimmer in the air, a weak place just at the edge of the parking strip. Through it he could see faint shapes. He was right. There it was, complete and real, as real as the sidewalk under him. A long metallic bar was cut off by the edges of the circle. He recognised it, the safety railing he had leaped over to enter the exhibit. Beyond it was the safety screen system. Turned off, of course. And beyond that, the rest of the level and the far walls of the history building. He took a cautious step into the weak haze. It shimmered around him, misty and oblique. The shapes beyond became clearer. A moving figure in a dark blue robe. Some curious person examining the exhibits. The figure moved on and was lost. He could see his own work desk now. His tape scanner and heaps of study spools. Beside the desk was his briefcase, exactly where he had expected it. While he was considering stepping over the railing to get the briefcase, Fleming appeared. Some inner instinct made Miller step back through the weak spot as Fleming approached. Maybe it was the expression on Fleming's face. In any case, Miller was back and standing firmly on the concrete sidewalk when Fleming halted just beyond the juncture, face red, lips twisting with indignation. Miller, he said thickly, come out of there. Miller laughed. Be a good fellow, Fleming. Toss me my briefcase. It's that strange looking thing over by the desk. I showed it to you, remember? Stop playing games and listen to me, Fleming snapped. This is serious. Carnap knows. I had to inform him. Good for you, the loyal bureaucrat. Miller bent over to light his pipe. He inhaled and puffed a great cloud of grey tobacco smoke through the weak spot out onto the R level. Fleming coughed and retreated. What's that stuff? he demanded. Tobacco. One of the things they have around here. Very common substance in the 20th century. You wouldn't know about that. Your period is the 2nd century BC. The Hellenistic world. I don't know how well you'd like that. They didn't have very good plumbing back there. Life expectancy was damn short. What are you talking about? In comparison, the life expectancy of my research period is quite high. And you should see the bathroom I've got. Yellow tile. And a shower. We don't have anything like that at the agency leisure quarters. Fleming grunted sourly. In other words, you're going to stay in there. It's a pleasant place, Miller said easily. Of course, my position is better than average. Let me describe it for you. I have an attractive wife. Marriage is permitted, even sanctioned in this era. I have two fine kids, both boys, who are going up to the Russian River this weekend. They live with me and my wife. We have complete custody of them. The state has no power of that yet. I have a brand new Buick. Illusions, Fleming spat. Psychotic delusions. Are you sure? You damn fool. I always knew you were too ego-recessive to face reality. You and your anachronistic retreats. Sometimes I'm ashamed I'm a theoretician. I wish I had gone into engineering. Fleming's lip twitched. You're insane, you know. 
You're standing in the middle of an artificial exhibit, which is owned by the History Agency, a bundle of plastic and wire and struts, a replica of a past age, an imitation, and you'd rather be there than in the real world? Strange, Miller said thoughtfully. Seems to me I've heard the same thing very recently. You don't know a Dr. Grunberg, do you? A psychiatrist? Without formality, Director Carnap arrived with his company of assistants and experts. Fleming quickly retreated. Miller found himself facing one of the most powerful figures of the 22nd century. He grinned and held out his hand. You insane imbecile, Carnap rumbled. Get out of there before we drag you out. If we have to do that, you're through. You know what they do with advanced psychotics? It'll be euthanasia for you. I'll give you one last chance to come out of that fake exhibit. Sorry, Miller said. It's not an exhibit. Carnap's heavy face registered sudden surprise. For a brief instant, his massive poise vanished. You still try to maintain? This is a time gate, Miller said quietly. You can't get me out, Carnap. You can't reach me. I'm in the past, 200 years back. I've crossed back to a previous existence coordinate. I found a bridge and escaped from your continuum to this. And there's nothing you can do about it. Carnap and his experts huddled together in a quick technical conference. Miller waited patiently. He had plenty of time. He had decided not to show up at the office until Monday. After a while, Carnap approached the juncture again, being careful not to step over the safety railing. An interesting theory, Miller. That's the strange part about psychotics. They rationalise their delusion into a logical system. A priory. Your concepts stand up well. It's internally consistent. Only... Only what? Only it doesn't happen to be true. Carnap had regained his confidence. Yet, he seemed to be enjoying the interchange. You think you're really back in the past? Yes, this exhibit is extremely accurate. Your work has always been good. The authenticity of detail is unequalled by any of the other exhibits. I tried to do my work well, Miller murmured. You wore archaic clothing and affected archaic speech mannerisms. You did everything possible to throw yourself back. You devoted yourself to your work. Carnab tapped the safety railing with his fingernail. It would be a shame, Miller. A terrible shame to demolish such an authentic replica. There was silence. I see your point, Miller said, after a time. I agree with you, certainly. I've been very proud of my work. I'd hate to see it all torn down. But that really won't do you any good. All you'll succeed in doing is closing the time gate. You're sure? Of course. The exhibit is only a bridge, a link with the past. I passed through the exhibit, but I'm not there now. I'm beyond the exhibit. He grinned tightly. Your demolition can't reach me. But seal me off if you want. I don't think I'll be wanting to come back. I wish you could see this side, Carnap. It's a nice place here. Freedom. Opportunity. Limited government. Responsible to the people. If you don't like your job, you can quit. There's no euthanasia here. Come on over. I'll introduce you to my wife. We'll get you, Carnap said, and all your psychotic figments along with you. I doubt if any of my psychotic figments are worried. Grunberg wasn't. I don't think Marjorie is. We've already begun demolition preparations, Carnap said calmly. We'll do it piece by piece, not all at once. So you may have the opportunity to appreciate the scientific and artistic way we take your imaginary world and people apart. You're wasting your time, Miller said. He turned and walked off, down the sidewalk to the gravel path and up onto the front porch of his house. In the living room, he threw himself down in the easy chair and snapped on the television set. Then he went into the kitchen and got a can of ice-cold beer from the refrigerator. He carried it happily back into the safe, comfortable living room. As he was seating himself in front of the television set, he noticed something rolled up on the low coffee table. He grinned wryly. It was the morning newspaper, 
which he had looked so hard for. Marjorie had brought it in with the milk, as usual, and, of course, forgotten to tell him. He yawned contentedly and reached over to pick it up. Languidly, confidently, he unfolded it and read the big, black headlines. Russia reveals cobalt bomb. Total world destruction ahead.